Even after World War I and onwards, the Netherlands Navy realized the obstacles it faced were immense. At home, the Navy realized it could do little to defend the country. When Germany inevitably rearmed, if it was belligerent, the threat would be mostly to the army, with little for the Navy to contribute. On the other side of the globe was the East Indies, the economic center of the Netherlands. Here, realistically, they faced Japan, the third largest navy in the world. Industrially and financially, matching Japan wasn't going to happen. Their only hope was to deter, or failing that, delay an invasion long enough that one of the other major powers would come to their aid, or help them reconquer it. This was likely, but by no means certain. Americans, for their part, didn't particularly like colonialism. I know some of you are yelling, Philippines, Philippines, right now, but we'll get to that. In a more general sense, up until Pearl Harbor, most Americans were apathetic to intervening in foreign affairs. They kept track of them, but saw little benefit in getting involved. Besides, most Americans couldn't even find Jakarta on a map. If a Pacific War did come that involved the U.S., their goal was the security of the Philippines and little beyond that. The British, on the other hand, had a long-standing alliance with the Japanese. Depending on how things played out, they could end up neutral or worse, supporting Japan. If Japan did attack the British also, then the British's priorities were going to be British priorities. <laughs> so while not likely, it was very possible the small Netherlands fleet could end up facing Japan alone. So what was their best option? Surface ships could take a stab at it, but the odds weren't good. World War I, however, had shown there were options. Submarines and mines. Both had caused a lot of problems for the much larger Royal Navy back in the war. Even took out a few battleships. Really messed up their merchant fleet, too. And both are pretty cheap. So, the Navy began developing its submarine and mine arms. It even worked with the Germans, which went a long way to keeping German submarine technology evolving. Gee, thanks. As a result, when the war came to the Netherlands, while their submarine force wasn't big, it was technically innovative. It was the Netherlands that first introduced the snorkel, for example, which then fell into German hands. They also had a disproportionately high percentage of mine layers and sweepers in their fleet. But they had other problems too. Crewing was a big problem. Even with a small fleet, they struggled to just man the ships they had. Even by using native Indonesians, whose loyalty was understandably generally considered unreliable, it was a challenge to keep ships manned. I could go on about this, but you get the idea. Another problem was maintenance. Yes, they had docks in the East Indies, even after the Netherlands was overrun, but spare parts were another matter. They were on the other side of the planet, in enemy hands. And since a lot of their equipment was of German, local, or Swedish design, simply borrowing American or British wasn't easy. Many replacements had to be custom made or available equipment had to be adapted. This led to long refits and overhauls followed by extensive retraining, sometimes of new crews as existing crew had been reassigned. And I'm not even going to get into the economics. In terms of submarines, traditionally their submarine force was divided into two kinds. The O-type Onder Sea Boat was meant to operate in the Atlantic as short-range patrol boats, while the K Colonies type was meant to operate in the East Indies as long-range boats. This despite even their large subs being relatively small. Seems straightforward enough, right? Well, more on that later. Most of their operational subs were in the East Indies when the war came to the Netherlands in May 1940, the new O-21 class being still under construction at the time. Again, they knew where they could make a difference. Operationally, even before the Pacific War started, it was agreed their subs should come under British control. As such, most of the few frontline boats moved to Singapore just before the start of the war. Like the U.S. Asiatic fleet in the Philippines, when Singapore became untenable as a base, they fell back to Java 
when they fell, they headed to either Australia or mostly Sri Lanka. The staffing and maintenance problems already mentioned made persistent and effective patrols of the East Indies difficult in the middle of the war. Major overhauls usually had to be made either in England or the U.S. Later in the war, many came under the U.S.'s 7th Fleet Southwest Pacific control and began again patrolling the East Indies out of Fremantle in earnest, many times inserting special operations teams. That's not to say they weren't ready to fight. Throughout the war, wherever they served, like most free forces, they were eager to get at the enemy. In fact, despite their few numbers at the start of the Pacific War, their commander, Admiral Helfrich, earned the nickname Once a Day Helfrich due to his few subs seemingly sinking a Japanese ship every day. As such, it's not practical to go over the ships they sank on their patrols but it is a painful indictment of what the U.S. subs could have achieved in the first months of the war if they had had working torpedoes. The oldest subs I'm going to cover were the three subs of the 528 surfaced and 426 tons submerged K-8 class, which were started in 1917. Designed by the U.S.'s electric boat company, the experience of World War I delayed their construction but did allow them to take advantage of many of the lessons learned. They were double hauled. These were pretty tired old girls by the start of the Pacific War with pretty worn out machinery, essentially relegated to reserve in the East Indies. When Java was overrun, the two that could get to sea headed to Australia where they were relegated to training. K-7 was started October 31st, 1917 and was completed September 15th, 1922. K-9 was started March 1st, 1919, and was completed June 21st, 1923. K-10 was started November 1st, 1919, and was completed September 24th, 1923. Main armament was six 450mm torpedo tubes, four at the bow with one reload each and two at the stern with no reloads. One 88mm deck gun was carried in front of the sail. Propulsion on the surface and recharging the batteries was provided by two diesel engines, each running a propeller. On K-8, they produced 1,800 horsepower, on the others, 1,550. As a result, K-8's surface speed was 16 knots, while the other two could do 15. While submerged, their batteries produced 800 horsepower for a speed of 8 knots. Test depth was 50 meters. K-8 was in the East Indies in May 1940 and stayed there through the start of the Pacific War, essentially sitting in reserve. In early January 1942, she was nominally returned to service, but mostly acting as a training boat. Near the end of February, she briefly patrolled the northern coast of Java. In the first half of March, she sailed to Fremantle, where due to her condition, she was put in reserve. Then, in mid-May, decommissioned her hulk being retained at first bears. Beached in 1943, she was demolished in 1957 as a hazard to navigation. K-9 was in the East Indies in May 1940 and stayed there through the start of the Pacific War, mostly in reserve status. In early March, she escaped to Fremantle, arriving in the middle of the month, and was relegated to training. While at Sydney Harbor at the end of May, she was badly damaged by a Japanese mini-sub. In mid-July, with repairs slowly ongoing, she was decommissioned, but work did continue with Royal Australian Navy and U.S. help, the boat essentially being given to the RAM. In late June 1943, she was commissioned into the Australian Navy as HMAS K-9, with a laundry list of problems still remaining. HMS K-9 was decommissioned at the end of February 1944 and returned to the Netherlands Navy. In mid-May 1945, she was converted into an oil storage hulk. In early June, she broke her toe and ran ashore in New South Wales. In late July, the wreck was sold for scrap, but while the fuel was recovered, the hulk wasn't. K-10 was in the East Indies in May 1940 and stayed there through the start of the Pacific War, mostly in reserve status. Despite a few patrols, by the start of March 1942, she was so worn out 
how she was scuttled at Surabaya rather than hazard the trip to Australia. Later, the Japanese raised her and used her as an oil storage hulk. In 1946, she was scrapped.